Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. It, as Director Pingree said, it's great to see everybody here. I'm Melanie Loisum, Commissioner of the Maine Department of Environmental Protection and Co-Chair of the Maine Climate Council. Welcome today to a briefing that we'll be providing to you on the work of the Equity Subcommittee, the report that they've produced, and the work that we're going to be asking, particularly the working group members, to be undertaking in the months to come. Uh, reviewing the recommendations of that report and uh, translating that into prioritized recommendations for each of your working groups. Uh, so this briefing is in particular for our members to think about the work that's ahead. I'd like to thank you all for participating and also let you know that if you have any questions today, if you put them in the chat, they'll go to Dr. Cassandra Rose and she'll send those on to your working group chairs uh, and they will be following up on those. And we'd also encourage you after this meeting, if you have any questions to please be in touch with the chair of the working group that you're participating in. And with that, I'll turn it over to Director Pingree. Great, well, thank you, Commissioner Loisum, also known as Melanie. Um, it's again, it's great to be back with you all. And this is a bit of a, a we, we don't we haven't had a meeting of all of the main climate council and working group and subcommittee members in a while so it's I think again this is a briefing to help get people up to speed on where we are and an important task ahead but again um, we hope the next meeting we see you all at maybe in person um, so we'll keep you posted on that um, just uh, I am uh, if you hear anything in the background, there was a lot of fire trucks. I'm in the city of Portland, uh, which is louder than where I usually zoom in from. Um, and I was just with the governor who gave a talk about Maine's climate plan and Maine's role in the world on climate leadership. And the last question she was asked about, it was about equity. So um, obviously uh, a great kickoff for where we are today and good context as we dive into this briefing and work ahead. So. I'm just going to ask Amanda or whoever is sharing the slides to kick them off. Great. Um, again, this is a, uh, a briefing and we're going to uh, kind of get you up to speed on uh, just a reminder of where we are and where we are going. Um, so next slide. So this is a slide I think many of you have seen many times. Um, for those of you who have been involved in our climate council process now for, for several years, um, the Maine Climate Council is uh, a group that sort of sits at the top of this. We have had a science and technical subcommittee as well as the six, six working groups who've been with us um, since September, 2019 when we kicked off this entire process. Um, the thought on equity is was that it was always uh, a key part of the legislation that created the Maine Climate Council. Um, considering equity and how we implement our plan has been at the core of the work of all of the working groups as they went through their nearly two year process. Um, as well as as we went through that process, we realized we needed to do more. We needed to understand um, the implications for equity. Um, and then we specifically um, engaged the University of Maine um, and they did a, a report on equity that was delivered to the Climate Council before we finished our report. One of the major recommendations of uh, UMaine's report to us was that we needed this work to be, um, to be uh, highlighted. It needed to be both part of the work of the working groups, but it also needed to be elevated. Um, so after the climate plan was launched, December 1, um, 2021, we created the equity subcommittee and they have spent, or sorry, I'm a year off. They've spent the last year um, really diving into the recommendations of the main climate plan and how we can better advance equity as we think about implementation and metrics. Um, so uh, this morning's meeting is really about the work ahead. The equity subcommittee has done incredibly heavy lifting. I see many of them on my Zoom screen, as well as some of the key staff. Um, and they have thought, I think, very thoughtfully about all of the eight strategy areas of Maine Won't Wait um, and how we can better advance equity as we advance climate solutions. Um, so again, I just wanna uh, thank them for their heavy lifting. Um, and their work really uh, paves the way for, for what's next. So next slide. 
So hopefully many of you have seen it. We talked about it at our February Climate Council meeting. Um, but after a year, the Equity Subcommittee delivered a report with 57 recommendations to the Maine Climate Council. Um, again, I highly encourage you to, to dive deep into their plan. Um, but the, today is, is really about the handoff. These 57 recommendations are now going back. Um, to the working groups who um, are the subject matter expertise and the process ahead is, is what we are here to talk about. Um, so we'll make sure that you have um, these uh, links as well in the chat, but again, I um, highly encourage you to read the report. Um, we are very grateful for the work of the co-chairs of the equity subcommittee, as well as the members who, who stepped up. Um, their job was actually an enormous one to both um, think deeply about equity, but think about uh, a variety of areas of climate from transportation um, to resilience, um, and they did some incredibly heavy lifting. So I just want to, again, uh, thank them very, very much. Next slide. Um, so I, I won't go into the details, and we really won't get into a lot of um, specific detail this morning, um, but I just want to, for those of you who, who haven't um, gone deep into the equity subcommittee recommendations yet. Um, we put just sort of three examples of the kinds of things that came out of the equity subcommittee report that have really, I will say, are already uh, uh, essential to, as we think about our climate plan and work ahead at the state level. Um, but I think there are three good examples of, of how um, we, three, three things coming out of the equity subcommittee that will be before the working groups in the months ahead. So first recommendation around clean school transportation. We have incredible opportunity, especially through the new federal infrastructure bill um, to bring more clean school buses, electric uh, school buses to the state of Maine. Um, a priority of the Biden administration is to make sure that disadvantaged school districts um, are competitive and, and really um, brought to the top when we think about this kind of funding in the state of Maine. So how do we develop a program that really centers equity as we implement new clean school bus um, opportunities for the state of Maine? Another recommendation was diversity in the clean energy sector. So really the, the core of our work is about a transition to clean energy, but a transition um, that brings good paying jobs to the people of Maine. So how do we ensure that women and people of color um, and disadvantaged communities are really um, have access to the kind of good paying jobs that we're gonna see in our state? Another um, exciting recommendation, one we're already thinking about, but one we're excited um, to have a working group continue to dive deeper on how do we really make that happen. Um, the last recommendation we're highlighting is climate resilience planning. Um, I've, I'm incredibly excited. We're actually sort of in the middle of launching a program that um, our office has led um, to engage communities in um, climate action, climate resilience, as well as emission reduction strategies. Um, so how do we ensure that all communities can do this? Again, something uh, we are already adding additional resources to make sure that especially the most under resources have access to these programs. Um, but we want to do that work in a meaningful and ongoing way. So I know that Judy East um, and the Resilience Working Group um, will help us dive into ways to ensure we're really doing that well. Next slide. So uh, probably uh, most importantly, I want to introduce the two co-chairs of the Equity Subcommittee, Ambassador Molly and Dana from the Penobscot Nation, as well as Gabriela Alcalde, um, the director of the Sewell Foundation, um, the two of them are, we are very, very lucky to have such um, tremendous leadership of this work. Um, two folks who are incredibly passionate about these issues and did, again, a lot of heavy lifting over the course of the last year, which brings us um, to where we are today. So I will um, hand it off to Ambassador Dana and Gabriella um, for a couple of comments. And I know they're out there, I saw them. So I'm sure we're in the process of unmuting them. This is Gabriella, can you all hear me? We can hear you, there okay. you are. I think Ambassador Dana and I were both being polite and waiting for each other. So. <laughs> I can't see her on the screen, so I decided to go ahead. Um, thank you so much for, for having me. And I'll keep my, my comments brief just to say that 
I think we're in a really critical juncture of any policy, especially very ambitious policy that has such um, long, long-term impact, but also widespread impact. Um, and the implementation is really where it all hits the, where the rubber hits the road. So I think this is a critical juncture where the working groups really take the recommendations and think about how they actually, how we actually make them into living practices and behaviors and norms. A lot of this, um, we spoke at the equity subcommittee, there are technical fixes that can help us in this, but a lot of this is actually changes in our assumptions, our attitudes, our systems our cultures, um, especially when it comes to equal and equitable dis distribution of resources and opportunities. So I'm very excited for us to be working with the working groups and to really translate these recommendations into meaningful action. I'll pass it over to Ambassador Dana. Thank you. And I am unmuted, thank you. <laughs> I was, I joined from a computer then a phone. So I, I think my role changed and I couldn't unmute. So uh, thank you so much, Gabriella. And uh, good morning to everyone. Thank you, Director Pingree and uh, Commissioner Loisem and the GOPIF staff, our facilitator, Carol Martin. Um, you know, this work was so well supported by the Climate Council uh, and GOPIF and just everyone that was involved. And, and I really wanna say, you know, so much deep felt, deep heartfelt thanks to our subcommittee members. We had great participation. Everyone took this work so seriously and thoughtfully and, and took this very bold climate action plan and took their job um, so very literally of looking at this through an equity lens. We covered I, probably, you know, 30 to 40 different ideas in every single session when looking at each of these topic areas. So I'm really proud of our recommendations. I, I think that they truly reflect the work that so many people put into this. And I'm really excited to see what the working groups make of it all and, and how we keep going forward together. We had public listening sessions and, and people were very excited about the work that we've done. And the uh, a main theme was, okay, now what? <laughs> you know, how do we measure this? How do we get it moving? How do we implement this? So this just feels like, like such a nice natural progression in that process. And, and I just continue to be very proud of this work and, and very thankful for all involved. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Dana and Gabriella, so much for the work that you led with the Equity Subcommittee um, and for that introduction this morning. I'm just going to go through briefly uh, the nuts and bolts of what we're planning to cover for the rest of this briefing. Our goal today is to talk about the work that you all are going to be doing in 2022 to advance the work of the Equity Subcommittee's recommendations, including establishing priorities and developing metrics. Um, as we talked about, this is the implementation stage and how are we going to measure our success in implementing it? Uh, so first we're gonna go through a workflow for the various working groups. Uh, we'll talk about the context and information that working groups should be providing around the equity subcommittee recommendations. You know, This is the stage where you're translating this into the specific work of the working groups and the topics that you're all focused on. Uh, we'll also talk to you about how to prioritize then your recommendations and ways to think about measuring the implementation of those. Uh, and then we'll hear from a few of our co-chairs from the working groups to talk about some thoughts that they've already had about the recommendations of the equity subcommittee and some of the things they're thinking about uh, for the work ahead for their working group. And then we'll wrap up with next steps and directions for everybody. So to get us moving in that direction, I'd like to introduce Jessica Scott from the Governor's Office of Policy Innovation in the Future. Um, all right, looks like I'm unmuted now. Thanks for doing that, uh, Cassie. And good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. Good to see so many members of the working groups, um, co-chairs, and of course, of the Equity Subcommittee. I've had the pleasure of providing staff support to the subcommittee um, throughout its process so far. And so um, I'm gonna walk you kind of through um, in a little bit more detail than Melanie just did what we're doing here today. So next slide, please. 
As Melanie mentioned, our goal in today's briefing is to provide some details about the process to refine, to prioritize, and to develop metrics based on the interim recommendations of the equity subcommittee. So stepping back briefly, looking at this timeline, um, during our work together in 2020, leading up to the Climate Action Plan, we know that all of the working groups were asked to consider equity through the development of their draft strategies. And we also know that kind of recognizing that there were a fair number of things that you were balancing in a short timeline for that group, the Climate Council created the Equity Subcommittee to revisit the climate strategies and really to center equity as their primary consideration in developing recommendations for equitable outcomes of the Climate Action Plan. So in addition to setting kind of clear equity outcomes, the Equity Subcommittee was charged with developing metrics to monitor equitable climate implementation. So really thinking about how how do we know what success looks like and then how do we measure it? Over the course of last year, the equity subcommittee developed those 57 recommendations that Hannah referenced earlier, which are reflected in the interim report they presented to the Climate Council back in February of this year. And during its process, the subcommittee recognized that without additional context and expertise, it would be unlikely to suggest meaningful and appropriate metrics to monitor those equitable outcomes, to really think about how do we measure implementation. Therefore, what we're here proposing today to the working groups is a process to work together with each of the groups in the Science and Technical Subcommittee to provide further context and further content to each recommendation to help prioritize those which could have the biggest impact on priority populations or on equitable achievement of our climate goals and to provide additional input on how we can measure success. Over the course of what we'll propose, which is two meetings and a survey, um, as well as consultations with agencies and other partners, we hope to come forward with refined recommendations and metrics for the equity subcommittee to finalize and to submit to the Climate Council towards the end of this year for adoption. We envision the result of this work to be a set of climate equity recommendations that build on the existing climate strategies and become part of the Climate Action Plan and a set of appropriate and related metrics that we'll monitor moving forward. Again, building on those metrics already included in the climate plan. So that's kind of where we've been and where we're going. So talking about it in a little bit more detail, next slide, please. This is what we're proposing. Again, the whole point of today's briefing is to watch walk through each of these steps. So I'm really just setting you up here to understand the flow of today's meeting. I'm really grateful to each of the co-chairs of the working groups who've talked with the equity staff team, who've helped define and develop and then refine this collaborative process. And in short, um, what we're proposing is that working groups will meet once to really discuss the intent of each recommendation. They'll meet with the equity subcommittee uh, members uh, and to provide their expertise and additional content to inform, to flesh out, or to refine the recommendations assigned to that working group. Following this meeting, the equity staff team will work to survey each working group about the prioritization um, of the recommendations they've been asked to consider. We'll talk through prioritization criteria today. The equity staff team then is gonna take all that feedback received through these individual conversations with working groups and work closely with co-chairs, with agency and program staff, and with other partners to further refine the recommendations and to develop draft metrics for each. We'll then bring these refined recommendations and a package of metrics back to the working groups for further feedback and then advance them to the equity subcommittee to conclude their work. Next slide. And so in a timeline here, this is how, this is when we propose you do the work I've just overviewed briefly. So after this briefing, today is a really critical place to kind of lay the foundation, get us all started, get us all on the same page. After this, we've asked your working group to convene in um, kind of mid-May to mid-June to provide that additional feedback and recommendations. Following up on each of your meetings, that survey will come pretty quickly afterwards within a week or two following your May-June meeting. We will then work together with the equity staff team and some consultant support um, to refine, to consult with agencies, to really talk deeply about feasibility and implementation with responsible parties and develop metrics We'll ask again that each working group meets and convenes in the September or October timeframe to review that full package of materials that the equity staff team has developed over the summer. And then again, by early winter, the equity subcommittee will take all of that work from the working groups, a refined list of recommendations and metrics and package that all up for adoption by the Climate Council. So that's kind of like the, the what, 
the when, and we're going to talk a little bit more in detail today about the how. So next slide, please. I mentioned um, that following, particularly following the prioritization, um, we'd be able to have um, both the staff team and some consultant expertise. And I wanted to take this opportunity to introduce to you um, and to start to turn the floor over to um, our consultants. So as we've been working on developing this process, we've had really the great fortune to be able to work with Illum Advising, who's a nationally recognized consulting firm with really deep expertise in the development of equity metrics for implementation of climate and clean energy programs. Illum has helped develop the prioritization and metrics framework that will serve as the foundation of our work together over the coming months, as well as really helped us think through how to structure engagement between the equity subcommittee and the working groups. We wanted to make sure that we could provide you a very clear roadmap as to how you would accomplish this work and what the work would, um, kind of what the result of the work would be. And we've worked with the Loom to develop that roadmap. So it's my pleasure to introduce Amanda Dwelly, a director at Loom Advising and a fellow Maine resident who's gonna walk through the May meeting, the prioritization framework and the different types of equity metrics that I've just talked about, but just at a greater level of, level of detail. So over then to Amanda to keep us moving through today's agenda. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Jess, for that intro. Um, very happy to be here um, speaking with you. Um, I'm a Midcoast Maine resident and director at Illum Advising, um, which Jess said is a national research and evaluation company. And what that means is we have national experience in energy and climate program evaluation from developing metrics and measurement frameworks to thinking about data collection, research, and tracking that's required to figure out if a program or investment is working and whether it's really serving or benefiting priority populations and disadvantaged communities. Um, we've done a lot of research and evaluation of low-income programs and programs with and for disadvantaged and vulnerable communities and are working with several states right now to figure out how to measure their progress toward climate and equity goals. Um, and, and very grateful um, to be here um, and have your time and attention this morning um, and excited to be part of this um, so thoughtful strategic process of thinking about um, equity recommendations and strategies to meet Maine's climate goals. So what I'd love to share today um, is a little more information on those three areas that Melanie laid out. Um, first, a little bit about providing um, context for the equity subcommittee recommendations to help refine and prioritize recommendations. Then a little bit about um, this survey-based approach to getting even more feedback um, to help prioritize recommendations and develop feasible and implementable strategies. And then really get into the metrics development process more as a primer, as a referent and reference. I'll be really talking through some of the steps the state equity team might be, um, but the, the purpose in sharing it with this broader group today is really to, to introduce a common framework and language um, that you can take to reviewing those metrics, but also that hopefully might be helpful as you start to think about data and tracking um, related to the recommendations. Um, so thinking about this process we might walk through, this is something that um, the equity staff team con consulted with the working group co-chairs to refine and develop and really figure out how the working groups can best contribute your subject matter expertise and your time um, to refine the recommendations and develop metrics. Um, and as Hannah mentioned at the beginning, if you do have ideas or questions about this process, um, Cassie is collecting them today in the chat. If you type them in the chat today, um, also please get in touch with your co-chairs and they'll take that feedback and integrate it into the process for the next time that you meet. Um, so the first thing I really wanna talk about is, um, is consideration for this May-June meeting. Um, where the working groups um, will each be looking at a subset of the recommendations most related to their expertise and meeting together and with equity subcommittee members to discuss those specific recommendations. So in advance of those meetings, you'll receive 
a shorter list of equity subcommittee recommendations most relevant to you and your group. So maybe about four to 10 per group and have that May, June meeting to discuss. Um, at that meeting, equity subcommittees mem members will be there to share um, the context and the intended outcome of each recommendation. And a lot of that information is already embedded in the equity subcommittee report. There's great information um, about the intended outcome, but really a chance to talk that through for them to talk through what that recommendation and those strategies are really trying to achieve, what their vision of success is, for whom, um, who are the specific Mainers for whom um, this recommendation is, is tailored. And we'll talk a little bit more uh, about that later, um, kind of starting to use this general definition of priority populations, which could mean any number of groups or communities, and really why it's important. What's the potential equity impact and what's the potential impact or connection to Maine's climate goals? Um, and through the course of this discussion, really having a chance to focus on each specific recommendation in your, or your area, um, the working groups um, could provide feedback on what's already happening. Um, are some of these strategies already happening? Are there existing programs that are doing this, whether inside or outside of the state? Um, based on your knowledge and experience with those programs, what insights, history, or data do you have to inform or refine the recommendation or strategy? What information do you have um, about what works or doesn't work? And that, that can kind of lead up to this big question of, given the intent of the recommendation, what it's trying to do and who it's trying to serve, um, do you feel that the strategy in the equity subcommittee's report is the best way to reach that intended outcome? Are there other strategies? Are there other considerations for finding the best way to reach that intended outcome? Um, and also questions like how, um, how would you define what success looks like? And what are some ways really thinking forward to metrics um, to assess the potential impact of this? Um, and as Hannah, Melanie, and Jess have mentioned, this is all meant to be input to refining and prioritizing the recommendations, just building more context. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is what happens after that May and June meeting, where the state equity team will be listening to um, collecting, synthesizing so much feedback um, and still want a chance, you know, to maybe collect that and, and get even more information that they can structure into prioritizing and refining the recommendations. So a follow-up activity to that um, could be a survey in the summer. Um, and the co-chairs and equity staff team will help develop this survey after the May meetings as a way to gather your input on the recommendations that you're most familiar with um, as input to help prioritize the recommendation. So what I wanna talk about next is a potential framework or, or some dimensions to think about that the state team might be thinking, thinking about and prioritizing the recommendations. Um, and so again, these are um, ideas that were kind of co-developed um, by the state team and co-chairs as a framework to prioritize the recommendations. Um, if you have questions or additional ideas, please share them with your co-chairs and we can work to incorporate them into the survey. Um, so really the goal for this, is this survey and getting input on prioritization is to identify equity subcommittee recommendations that state agencies and partners can prioritize in, in implementation. Um, so here's um, really four dimensions or ways to think about prioritization. Um, one, as you can imagine, um, is, um, is the potential equity impact of the recommendation. Um, all 57 of the recommendations are designed to um, bring about more equity in Maine's climate plan, um, but some considerations um, for that are what is the potential breadth and reach of the recommendation or strategies, and really specifically what priority populations does it serve, and really defining who those populations are, not just for clarifying the recommendation, but thinking forward to 
data metrics and tracking, what do you need to really understand if you're benefiting and serving those populations? And in some cases, there might be recommendations that might not have an extremely broad reach at first, but might be designed to address or solve critical barriers. So is this recommendation really something that's critical to address or solve a big need you're seeing. Um, another dimension to look at is the connection to the climate plan and the potential equity um, equity impacts for the climate plan. And this is your chance to really bring it back to some of your original um, recommendations and strategies in your working group that, that you gave to the Climate Council. How does the recommendation tie to relate to Maine's climate plan? Um, the third and fourth items here are really about implementation, feasibility, and timing. Um, so first thinking about um, not just the feasibility with existing resources, but what some resource needs may be for really high impact strategies that might need, you know, more work, resources, time to support. Um, so first thinking about what's possible with existing staff, existing resources, and existing funding. And then what are high impact strategies um, for which you, um, state agencies, state agency partners might need significant additional funding resources and so on. And this is really a chance to, to lay those out. Um, it's it's nothing, nothing here is saying that things might be prioritized or deprioritized on this basis. It's really about what is the feasibility and resource needs and how can those fit into an overall strategy of what agencies and partners might implement and need resources for. Um, similar um, idea with timing, there might be recommendations that are um, they're, you know, already underway, very possible, feasible to implement in a short time frame, um, able to see results in one year. And there might be, as Gabriella mentioned, things with very long-term needs or long-term impact. Um, and this is a chance to really talk about what is a longer term need or strategy? And then what are some of the steps along the way um, to lead up to a long-term impact? Um, so just to recap a little bit, uh, this summary of what might happen in May and June and the survey um, afterward, this is a process that the state developed with the co-chairs um, and are really looking forward to working through with, with the working groups. Um, as I mentioned, um, and others have mentioned, um, definitely follow up with your co-chairs for any questions um, you have so that they have a chance to respond and, um, and kind of tailor the, the May meeting. Um, so this slide just kind of captures um, this process all together um, to summarize that May and June meeting the state equity team will send out um, a shorter list of equity subcommittee recommendations rel relevant to each working group. And the co-chairs can figure out you know, the order to discuss those and prioritize them. And during that May and June meeting, um, the working group members um, can provide context and feedback um, in discussion with equity subcommittee members who will be there to really describe some of the context and the intended um, outcomes of those recommendations. And then to, to make sure that the state has you know, enough information um, to refine and prioritize things and then can kind of structure that information and here's everyone's expertise. Um, the plan right now is for a survey, a follow-up survey with questions on some of those um, four dimensions I mentioned previously to help prioritize the recommendations. So kind of a breakdown of questions getting at equity impact, feasibility, timeline, and connection to the climate plan. Um, after the state team receives all of those responses, they'll be compiling your feedback and also um, speaking with agencies and partners to get their feedback on feasibility, resource needs, timing, potential impacts, and use everyone's impact between the working groups, equity subcommittee, agencies, and partners to refine the list of equity subcommittee recommendations. And that refine and prioritize list is something that, um, that everyone, the working groups and equity subcommittee will have a chance to review um, in the fall in those September and October meetings. And that's also the list 
of recommendations that will feed into metrics development. So, um, and I'll talk about metrics in a minute, but the idea there is um, um, the state will be working to develop success metrics, um, not against the original 57 recommendations, but against possibly a shorter um, and more refined list. Um, and I'll stop here and open it up to Hannah, Melanie, and Jess, if you wanna add or clarify anything. Thanks, Amanda. Um, the only thing that I'll say is that we we recognize that this is quite a lot in this briefing today, and there's more coming. As Amanda noted, kind of the next step here is to talk through metrics and to give us some shared language for thinking about monitoring success. This deck and this recorded briefing will be available to all working group members and the Climate Council and posted um, for reference afterwards. So don't worry. We know we're overwhelming you a little bit today, but this is really here uh, for you to reference. The other thing that has been mentioned a few times is I just really, I, I'm so appreciative of the work we've done to develop this process in collaboration with the co-chairs so far. Um, we have appreciated your feedback. We've appreciated trying to make this um, a really meaningful activity for each of the working groups and a um, reasonable ask on your time, given your commitments and given all the work that we've been doing on this so far. So thank you for that collaboration. Um, I don't know if Melanie, Melanie or Hannah have anything further to say. I see Melanie shaking her head. The no, back I, mean, I think, yeah. Jez, you, you've characterized it well. And I think that, um, I think the process approach, again, I, Jess and Amanda both highlighted this. This is really going to have different um, implications for each working group. And the recommendations are, themselves are also very diverse. And some of them are really um, sweeping and, and, you know, could be considered by each working group and some are very specific. Um, so I think that uh, the process is important. Process has been important to everything we've done um, at the main climate council. And I think really engaging the subject matter experts as we think about the next steps, especially implementation metrics is key. But I think, again, there's sort of no easy way to describe this because every recommendation is very different. It has very different next steps, very different actors involved very different in terms of some of them are about process and some of them are really about programs. So um, I think this will all become, uh, you know, a lot more concrete as you move into the work and start to think about each specific recommendation that, that gets referred to your working group. So again, I'm, I'm grateful for the heavy lifting that's happened. And I think the work ahead, um, it will get clearer as we really dive into it. Thanks, Hannah. Um, so Amanda, if you wanna take us then through this shared language around metrics. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone. I'm so excited to see 118 people in a meeting to, to think about and learn about metrics. Um, the equity subcommittee report calls for the subcommittee and working groups to collaborate this year to identify metrics to collectively monitor equitable implementation of the recommendations in Maine's climate action plan, which is part of the council's charge to the equity subcommittee. Um, and as Jess mentioned, the co-chairs in the state propose that the state team take the lead in drafting equity metrics um, with, with input from state agencies and partners and um, in the working groups and subcommittee and share a draft in the fall for working groups and the equity subcommittee to review. So in this section, I'm going to share um, some common terms and concepts for developing equity metrics that the state team will use. And, and the purpose of really talking about it today is to um, really create a common language and a foundation um, that you can use as you start thinking about and reviewing metrics and data and tracking needs. This primer is really meant to provide um, a common language for thinking and talking about measuring progress toward the equity subcommittee recommendations. And um, it, it is a lot of content in here. Um, we definitely don't expect anyone to become experts in metrics um, within the next 20 minutes. Um, and really starting here because, you know, it is a lot to start thinking about data and grateful to have this chance to kind of set this up so that it's in the back of your minds in the next few meetings and, um, and you feel comfortable, um, you know, as, as the fall rolls around to, to comment on metrics. 
Um, and so hopefully this can serve as a foundation and overview of the process the state team will take in developing metrics for the refined and prioritized recommendations. Um, so again, everything we're about to go through will be shared as a reference. And, um, and hopefully by sharing some of this language now, it might be helpful um, as you think forward to the data or research needed for implementation of the equity recommendations. So in this section, I'm going to really talk about some definitional um, ideas related to metrics in general, and then also about what makes equity metrics and developing equity metrics unique. How is that kind of different from developing metrics and measurement plans in general? And I'll share those common definitions. And then uh, one of my colleagues will actually walk through an example to kind of put it into practice using one of the transportation recommendations. So one of the first terms I want to talk about is, is the term metrics itself. Um, we're kind of using this as a general term. And when we think of metrics, we often think of counting or measuring things with numbers, but we're using it a little bit more generally here. Um, as Hannah mentioned, um, the 57 equity subcommittee recommendations are very diverse. A lot of them do talk about processes and programs, and, and only some of them can be measured strictly with numbers. Um, some of the recommendations do set a goal for, say, increased spending or participation among disadvantaged, highly impacted, or vulnerable populations, while a lot of the recommendations are about changes to program design or policies or starting with conducting a research study. Um, so part of this framework is making sure we have um, the types of metrics to match the types of outcomes envisioned by the equity subcommittee. Um, so on the left, there are some examples of distributive metrics. Um, and these are things that can be counted, tracked, or located. Distributive is the idea that um, different costs and benefits might be distributed to, to different people or communities in different ways. Um, so for example, the percentage of clean school bus funding going to disadvantaged communities, or the number or percentage of BIPOC minors contributing to participating in the development of community resilience plans. Um, a geographic example might be the percentage of EV charging stations in disadvantaged or frontline communities. Um, the number or percentage of mobile home residents participating in a weatherization program. And on the right, and really equally important, especially in light of everything in the equity subcommittee report, are procedural metrics. And these are to track the many different procedural recommendations and outcomes. Um, so these could relate to processes, policies, programs, actions. Um, and these are things where, you know, the tracking might not be a number, but really a yes, no of whether the recommendation happened. So an example might be setting up a task force, a working group or a stakeholder group, um, or conducting public outreach um, in impacted communities or with priority populations, or maybe establishing an outreach policy. Um, many of the recommendations talk about starting with a study to just understanding the current state in a baseline. So a uh, procedural metric might be, um, has that study been conducted? Is there baseline data on this? Um, or um, if the rec recommendation is about changing or modifying a program designer policy, um, has that change happened or what are steps in progress? The next thing I really want to talk about is um, what we're calling kind of short term and long term metrics. Um, you know, one of the things that that is laid out in the equity subcommittee report and that the working groups will have a chance to talk to, through is is the long term vision of success. What does success look like? Um, so part of this process is really figuring out what that endpoint looks like and how to measure it. And that's what we're kind of calling long term metrics. But then since some of these are really long term strategies. Um, that have a lot of steps in place to get there. What are the milestones on the road to get there and using the, the term short-term metrics? Um, so long-term metrics in both cases could be procedural or distributive metrics. Um, often they do tend to um, lean toward distributive metrics being more outcome-oriented. So it might be 
the percentage of participants or percentage of spending on priority populations, or ultimately, after a few years, um, what are what and where are um, different projects located? So what communities have um, completed resilience plans? Where are EV charging stations located? Where are air quality monitoring stations? Or a procedural metric might be um, our point of sale rebates available for high efficiency heating equipment. And then the state and others will be thinking about, okay, those might be some of the long-term goals, but what are what can we look at year over year to know there's progress happening toward that? Um, and these still could be procedural or distributed. So some kind of milestone. So um, is there a work group set up? Is there a plan in place? Um, what's the stakeholder process like? Um, there also could be some kind of interim tracking. Um, if, you know, even if you might not expect uh, participation rates to be um, at parity by a certain point, what do you know about awareness of different state programs um, among low-income or frontline populations? Or what is kind of awareness or participation of unemployed or underemployed Mainers in job training programs, even if we're not quite at the state of you know, measuring you know, the distribution of, of jobs? And again, really sharing these to just give a glimpse into what the state might be thinking about um, and some of the you know, steps um, they're taking and what you can think about as you look at metrics. And now I wanna get into a few considerations more unique to developing equity metrics. Um, the equity subcommittee really grounded themselves and started with an equity framework that consider, considers multiple types of justice. Um, which is laid out in their report. Um, and recommendation number two about procedural equity is, is a great example of procedural justice, but a lot of the principles of procedural, interactional, contextual, historical justice are embedded in a lot of the recommendations. Um, there are a lot of many different academic frameworks and terms you've probably seen for thinking about equity and justice, I would say looking across them, some of the common elements are really procedural and distributive justice. So those are the two green bubbles and some of the other terms below, um, you know, I've seen in different frameworks. Um, but this lens really thinking about procedural and distributive justice and some other types of equity is a lens that we wanna use and we can use to think about metrics and challenge ourselves to make sure that the metrics that are developed, that are developed really match all the layers of equity that are laid out in the equity subcommittee report. Um, so just as the equity subcommittee, um, you know, lays out outcomes, um, distributive outcomes, um, they're also thinking about the process of getting there. So similarly, the state team can think about metrics, not only in terms of the outcomes, but really in terms of um, facilitating fair processes. And again, I just, I wanted to highlight this as something that the state and others um, are keeping in mind as they develop metrics and you can keep in mind as you review to make sure and really hold ourselves accountable to thinking about um, developing metrics to measure progress on these dimensions as well as some of the numeric outcomes. Um, and another big difference um, in thinking about metrics in general and equity metrics is really taking a more laser focus on who each recommendation strategy and program is intending to serve. Um, at some point in refining the recommendations, um, you know, this really fine grained definition of, of who um, the recommendation is trying to serve it will really be important for figuring out data and tracking requirements. And in many cases, the equity subcommittee report um, does define that priority population either in the recommendation itself or in a strat um, the context that they provided. Um, so we're kind of using this term priority populations as a general term. There's many terms you could use to refer to this idea. Um, it's a general term used to describe that people or communities to be prioritized in a process or action. Um, and this could, could be um, both geographic communities 
and groups of people defined by other characteristics. So some examples of um, geographically defined priority populations might be disadvantaged communities, which is a general term that the equity subcommittee report uses to think about um, highly impacted and vulnerable communities. Um, frontline communities, taking some of that language of LD 1682, um, which might mean climate impacted communities. Um, indigenous, indigenous or tribal owned land, rural communities, coastal and island communities, areas with high asthma rates. So some of the recommendations, you know, might be general to disadvantaged communities, but some might be a specific community impacted by different things. And that can be something to consider um, in refining the recommendations and really figure out where exactly um, state agencies and partners can start tracking um, where investment is happening, where participation outreach is happening. Um, and another way to think about priority populations might not be geographic, but um, groups of people with, with shared characteristics. So this could be low-income households, um, BIPOC individuals or workers, um, unemployed or underemployed Mainers as a priority population for job training programs, um, individuals with disabilities, Native and Indigenous people, um, fishing, forestry, agricultural workers, or those from other heritage industries, um, residents of mobile or manufactured homes as priority um, groups for weatherization programs. And these are just examples, again, um, you probably have a lot of others in mind. I just wanted to call this out as something, um, really a common term that that I think everyone is, is really thinking about already in terms of equity, but as something to really carry through this process um, to define as it leads up to data and metrics. And finally, continuing this thought about data and metrics. Um, um, some of, um, what do I wanna talk about here? So, so one challenge, um, that you'll see as you start to read through the equity subcommittee recommendations is in some cases there might be limited baseline data um, to, to understand the current state of something who's currently served. In a lot of cases, the recommendations are actually calling for a study or, or more research um, to figure out how to implement something to develop a strategy. Um, and this, you know, the, the type of baseline and data that's needed um, might mean it, it might not be possible immediately to define numeric targets or goals or something. So, so many metrics frameworks, one of the endpoints might be saying specifically how many people um, should do a certain thing. So, um, you know, the number of heat pump installations um, among low income Mainers, for example, it might be nice to be able to define that specifically, but there might not be um, well, maybe that's not a great example. There probably is data, but in some cases there might not be easily available data right now to set a numeric goal, though that might be a long-term strategy. Um, so in addition to thinking about what data or research is needed, um, as the working groups in the state start to think about tracking metrics toward a goal, um, even without data to set numeric targets, um, there is this opportunity as you start to meet in May and June and think about metrics to really define what success looks like and what an equitable outcome could really look like. And, and that can be done in ways other than just with numbers. Um, so one way um, looking at these bullets in the bottom is really to think about even without numbers, what would an equitable outcome look like? Um, is it improvement over a baseline um, as a way to move toward parity? Are you looking for year over year progress, but maybe don't expect things to be totally equal? Um, are you seeking proportional representation, equal participation rates, equal rates of EV ownership, weatherization among priority populations? Um, or in some cases, is the recommendation seeking greater than proportional representation? Is it moving to correct um, historical injustice? Um, is it looking toward corrective or restorative justice? And those are things that um, I, I bring up here just as food for thought to think about, um, you know, in addition to kind of 
requesting data and tracking and studies um, to ultimately establish a goal, this opportunity to think about um, what an equitable um, outcome might look like in sense of your, you know, your sense of equity and justice. Um, and again, as I mentioned, you know, this, this is so much information um, and really meant as it's really kind of background and a foundation to think about this process as it might unroll um, over the next few months. Um, this was a lot of information and um, the state is certainly not expecting anyone to, to kind of become expertise in this area and the slide deck will definitely be available as a reference um, and meant to kind of create a shared language. Um, what I'm sharing here to kind of um, end this section is more of a recap of the process that the equity staff team um, developed uh, with the working group co-chairs, um, the process that the staff team will take in order to build metrics into the final equity report to the Maine Climate Council. Um, so, you know, the vision for that report, as Hannah and Melanie mentioned, is to um, contain their priority actions, um, recommendations, and strategies, as well as proposed metrics for consideration by the Climate Council. Um, so just looking at the left here, um, in terms of the metrics development, starting with the prioritized recommendation, um, really what is the desired equity outcome, including the priority population, which will be shaped by what's already in the equity subcommittee report, as well as the working group's work in, in May, June, and that survey to really fine tune and hone in on. Um, if there is the potential to set goals or targets, great. What are those goals or targets? Otherwise, it could be a vision or principle of what equity might look like. Um, then, so what are the long-term metrics to determine success? Given that intended long-term outcome, what would um, distributive metrics or procedural metrics look like to, to say that you've reached that? And then um, if it is kind of a long-term strategy or, you know, something complex with many steps, what are some short-term metrics or progress indicators to assess whether you're on the right track? And in that process at each of these stages um, will be a lot of implications for new data um, tracking and research needs that we're hoping um, will fall out and could be um, outlined in the report to, um, to the Climate Council. Um, and I will stop here and um, I'm curious, um, Hannah, Melanie and Jess, uh, if you wanna clarify anything or add anything before we move on. Amanda, I'm really appreciating um, the heavy lifting you're doing here um, on behalf of all of us to get us grounded in a shared language and in a framework. Just everyone take a deep breath. We recognize this is quite a lot of information and it may be new language for many of you. Um, and it's a reminder that it's the equity staff team in consultation with agencies, with the Climate Council and with co-chairs who will be doing this work in the summer um, to develop proposed metrics to bring back to the working groups in the fall. So the working groups aren't being asked to do this work directly. Um, your first input will be the context and the prioritization. And then we'll take all of this back and, and work very closely um, with your co-chairs and with other members kind of across the state and with our partner organizations. We just wanna make sure that you're thinking about where this work is going because we'll ask you to come back together in that September, October timeframe and comment on these proposed metrics on this proposed framework. So this is just language to give us all a sense to be able to think where we're going, think where we're ending up and think how we'll be monitoring again, that equitable implementation of the state's climate goals. Um, that's kind of just a reminder, deep breath. We have one more section of this agenda, but before we move there, um, Hannah and Melanie, anything else to say? Um, I'd just like to highlight what Amanda mentioned about uh, identifying needs for data and for research as, you know, these recommendations are coming back together from each of the working groups. I think it's good to recognize that you could be looking for some of the same information across the working groups. And so I think we're going to see intersections and synergies as you're bringing everyone's recommendations back together. Um, and so don't be too dismayed if you feel like there are a lot of data gaps that need to be addressed, because I think we may see it across various working groups. 
Yeah, I think I think Amanda, that's sort of where uh, my head is going as well. I mean, I will just say there are I think some really exciting efforts happening across state government that are really engaging state industries. There's a big bill before the main legislature about data collection, and I think. Uh, Honestly, I think the Climate Council in this work will actually help to lead the way. We're trying to make it meaningful. Why do we need this data to help improve people's lives and, and make our work more meaningful? And I think we will we will set the stage for some good work to happen in the next couple of years. But honestly, it's a, it's a long-term process. So we did the first four-year climate plan and we're now, you know, almost halfway through it. And the the sort of work that we are doing now will really make, I think, our next climate plan much more meaningful because setting these kinds of metrics, short-term, long-term, actually doing the data collection, um, I think will be uh, obviously where we wish we all were now, but I think it's really um, incredibly exciting work for the state of Maine. So I think when we really dive into it, we'll realize in places we've got some great data, we, we really know where we are, and other places we are just at the very beginning of a long journey. But I think um, I think Amanda describes it well, and I think we're going to, um, again, as we get into the details, um, it will be a lot more clear as to, to whether we're at the beginning or sort of halfway through the journey to, to um, meaningfully do this work. Great, so back over to Amanda and the Illum team for the last um, portion of this structured part of our agenda. Yeah, no, thank you, Hannah and Melanie for those points. And I and I do think that's really kind of what we're hearing in other states as well um, as, you know, a final screen to metrics is really thinking about what's the meaningful. At the end of the day, we're trying to figure out, you know, how to, you know, show and demonstrate um, the impact of Maine's climate actions and the impact it's having on people's lives. So really thinking about what metrics will be kind of meaningful to understand that. Um, and to kind of make this a little bit less abstract and ground it in one of the equity subcommittee recommendations, um, I wanna introduce my colleague, Allison Carlson, who's going to walk us through an example of how to kind of develop and think about metrics um, for one of the clean transportation recommendations. Great, thank you, Amanda, um, for that overview. Um, and as Amanda said, I'll go through one of the recommendations. Um, Amanda, I think you can just go to the next slide. Uh, and I'll bring you back to uh, recommendation seven, uh, which Hannah had um, highlighted uh, at the beginning of the presentation, um, which, which is one of the transportation sector recommendations. And uh, this recommendation stated that the Department of Education, um, Environmental Protection and Transportation and local school districts should study and recommend clean vehicle alternatives for school bus fleets in the state. And that clean vehicle incentives should prioritize funding in disadvantaged school districts. So just to kind of remind you of what that, what that reminder was. Um, and um, uh, of course, this is an, exa an example that we'll walk through of how one might pull together um, metrics and, and think about outcomes. Um, but of course, that could um, materialize in a, in a bit of a different way. Um, and for our purposes today, we'll just assume that this recommendation has been pr prioritized by the work group and then that they've also perhaps brought into this recommendation some additional context um, or things to be aware of within it. So you can see this kind of like the final recommendation for our purposes today. Um, you can go to the next slide. Okay, uh, so in bringing together the long-term equity outcome, we really want to think about how success looks like, what success looks like at the end of the day, as Amanda had highlighted um, previously. Um, so what has been achieved for Maine's people? Um, and there are a few questions that we want to ask as we bring together that long-term recommendation. So you can see that highlighted in the different bubbles, the, the who, who is this audience, um, this recommendation, recommendation targeted at? Um, is there someone who, who is going to be taking the action to, to make it happen? Um, for whom? Um, are there specific priority populations um, or communities that should benefit? Um, and this is really looking at, you know, where do we want to see the impacts of the recommendation? Um, and then also the what, um, what action do we want them to take? So these are the, the three key components that go into those outcomes as, as they're being drafted. Um, and um, so in our example today, the long-term outcome reads, um, more low-income disadvantaged rural school districts have adopted clean vehicle alternatives for their school bus fleets. 
Um, so as you probably noted, this is um, relatively straightforward and easy to understand and just kind of crystallizes um, in a very transparent, clear way um, what success means. Um, so that's an example of how a long-term equity outcome um, could come together. Um, we can go to the next slide. Okay, and then thinking about the short-term outcomes, you know, it's useful first to um, identify that long-term outcome, that kind of endpoint, so you have that in mind for the short-term outcomes. Um, and um, we really want to think about what needs to happen to ensure we're on track um, to meet that long-term outcome. Um, so the questions that we want to think about for the short-term outcome are still relevant for, for, the, for the, the questions that we thought about for the long-term outcome are still relevant for that short-term outcome. Uh, the who, um, who is this targeted at, who will be taking that action, uh, for whom, those priority population, and then what action um, needs to happen. Um, so we've identified a couple of what may be necessary elements to get to that long-term outcome here. Um, so as this reads, um, the state and local districts have a strong understanding of clean vehicle alternatives for disadvantaged districts, including what the path to adoption looks like. And then a second component of it um, is that the state has prioritized clean vehicle incentives or, or technical assistance for disadvantaged districts. Um, so that kind of, um, as we've noted, kind of lays out the, the key steps, the key elements that need to happen and need to occur in order to get to that long-term outcome. And then we'll go to the next slide. Okay, and once we've laid out that long-term and short-term outcome, um, we really want to, we, then we can um, assign those metrics um, and be able to determine whether the outcomes have been achieved. Um, so there are several questions that we want to answer um, as a part of this metrics development process. Um, and we've kind of divided these out in, into a few groups, the, the who or what is involved. So this could include defining those priority, priority populations and making sure that those are identified within the metric. Um, identifying relevant stakeholders as part of a procedural metric. You may want to ensure that uh, certain groups or um, certain people are involved in the process. Um, and then of course, those steps in the process for the short-term outcomes. Um, you also want to get as specific as you can. So defining key terms, um, there may be terms that um, if left open to interpretation, um, they could be defined in different ways. So again, just getting specific and making sure um, that you're honing in on things. Um, and then also identifying specific dates. Um, when do things need to be accomplished, specific milestones? Um, and then of course, if you're able to identify that for the, the long-term um, outcome. Uh, and then of course, thinking about the data and the measurements, um, identifying if uh, data is available, um, does data need to be identified and collected? Um, and then of course, identifying what limita limitations are involved as well. Um, so that is identified upfront. Um, and then determining what the measurement is. Um, of course, as Amanda discussed, for procedural, that might just be simply a yes or no. Um, for distributive metrics, um, you might identify um, an absolute number that needs to be captured um, or a percentage that is measured um, by a baseline. Um, so those are just a, a few of the questions that need to be considered as um, the metrics are brought together for those short-term and long-term outcomes. You can go to the next slide. Great, so and this is just um, um, a slide with a lot of things on it, but it kind of brings it together. Um, and it's an example of how one might kind of pull things together for the different recommendations. So here, of course, we have the prioritized recommendation, um, the different equity outcomes that are associated with it in the short term and the long term. Um, also the metric components. So um, the procedural, the distributive laying that out, um, and what, what kind of metrics or what kind of measurement is involved within it. And then also indicating the data sources and the data needs and different issues there. Um, so with that, we recognize, of course, um, as has been mentioned, this is a lot of information and um, you'll see the slide deck later, you can reference it um, as the process proceeds. Um, but I think at, at this point, um, unless there's anything else we wanna um, highlight on, on this section, um, I'll turn it back to the Climate Council co-chairs. Uh, Hannah and Melanie. Great, thank you so much for going through that. I know that, uh, as you said, it was uh, quite a bit of information for everybody to digest, so it'll be helpful to have the slides in the future, but I think that the framework that you've laid out 
uh, visually is tremendously helpful to try to understand how to proceed with the work that we've been describing today. So thank you for breaking it down into a way that uh, makes it easier for all of us to make our way through those recommendations. Uh, next, we'd like to hear from some of the co-chairs of our working groups. Uh, I know that you've all already been giving a lot of thought to the equity subcommittee's report. Um, and for many of the working groups already starting to think about the ways that those recommendations could apply to the topics that you're focused on. So first, I'd like to invite Kathleen Meal, our co-chair for the Buildings, Infrastructure, and Housing Working Group. Uh, she'd like to uh, provide a discussion of some of her preliminary thinking. And Amanda, you can pull up the slides if you want to um, so that we can see each other's faces again. Thank you. Thanks, Melanie. And thanks, everybody, for this incredible amount of work. And um, I was just thinking as, as we were going through the slides, thinking back to where we were two years ago when, when all of our working groups were, were frantically trying to, <laughs> to pull together our recommendations in the early days of the pandemic and, and all of those crazy things. Um, and I think about how, how incredible it was to have the, the breadth of expertise and experience and perspective that we had within each of our working groups and how even in those moments, we knew we didn't have everybody that we needed in the room. Uh, we knew we didn't have all of the, the, the data that we needed or the perspectives that we needed. And we really have had to, to sit with that sort of mismatch between the, the urgency of the work that we had to do in, in putting together our initial set of recommendations and the, the realization that we were, were doing the best that we could, but we're missing some really important pieces of the puzzle. And I'm so grateful for the equity subcommittee in, in taking the work that, that we did and reflecting on it, and then uh, having this incredible opportunity to, to reconnect and to sort of weave those perspectives together again now. Uh, so I'm really excited to, to get the band back together again and to, uh, to go through the recommendations of the equity subcommittee with this incredible support and guidance uh, from, from GOPIF and, uh, and Amanda and Allison walking us through exactly what we, what we need to do and some concrete examples. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this process. And I'll be, I'll be totally honest, I think that the, the result that we are building towards here, um, well, probably two years from now, we'll be able to say the same thing. We didn't have all the information at the time. We didn't have all the people in the room, but but we did the best we could and we, we moved it forward and we'll get to continue doing that work together in the next climate action plan. Um, and, you know, we do all represent so many different organizations and areas of expertise the, the ability to do this work in partnership with each other and then to take what we're learning back, uh, not just to the, the climate action plan, but, but to our individual work and to our organizational work. It's just a great opportunity and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks, Kathleen. Uh, next, we're gonna hear from Ken Colburn, the uh, co-chair of our energy working group. Thank you, Melanie. Um, I think Dan and I have a lot of work to do. We're, uh, we're, we're a bit, I don't want to say flummoxed, that, that sounds too strong and too permanent, but uh, as you all know, the Energy Working Group came up with four rec recommendations that are all pretty high level and not, not easily implemented um, um, through an equity lens, I think. And so we need to do some serious thinking on that because we were mostly supply oriented, whereas most of us think in terms of energy as our use of energy in the house, uh, but that's more on the building side or our use of energy in our vehicle, but that's on the transportation side. So I, I'll offer what I think are some macro um, ideas going in, at least my orientation, uh, TBD in discussion with Dan and the work group itself. Those go along the lines of this. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of John Holdren's uh, line. John Holdren was uh, 
director of Woods Hole, I think one of America's best climate scientists, science advisor to President Obama, so forth. And he said, with respect to climate change, that we can mitigate, we can adapt, or we can suffer. And the unique thing about climate change is that, uh, unlike, say, healthcare, where we can improve healthcare for many, uh, but perhaps not all, or we can improve education for many, but perhaps not all, or, or food quality and distribution. Climate is everyone. We're either going to mitigate successfully for everyone, or we will suffer. And we may be able to adapt effectively, uh, or we'll suffer. And interestingly, mitigate, adapt, and suffer um, is also the most cost-effective route as well. It's cheaper to mitigate than it is to adapt or suffer. It's cheaper to adapt than it is to suffer. So at the end of the day, uh, we have those three options and we need to approach it universally, not sort of incrementally or in any kind of segmented way. Happily, that also works, I think, uh, toward effectiveness. And effectiveness, to my mind, is best characterized by the fact that we can't decarbonize, we can't get adequate carbon out of the atmosphere by just decarbonizing the affluent. We need to decarbonize everybody, all the vehicles, all the buildings, not just those who can afford to do so. So again, we're all in this together, we'll all mitigate, adapt, or suffer. And second is, the, with respect to effectiveness, is that uh, research has shown that efforts in teams that are diverse and equitable and inclusive actually yield better results. You know, even, even if you work on diversity and have um, a bunch of white males from everywhere, or even a bunch of white people, not all males from everywhere, you're, you're still doing some form of groupthink. So the more diverse and equitable and inclusive our efforts are, the better the outcome will be, the more effective the outcome will be. So we need to take those things into mind from a purely effectiveness perspective. Now on the, on the energy side itself, energy is curious as done in Maine because Maine's pretty unique. Uh, we, we, unlike many of the programs that Amanda has um, studied for utilities, for example, um, Maine's efficiency work and how well it's distributed is, is done by the efficiency Maine Trust, not by a utility funded program or a utility conducted program. So we're different. Um, our utilities don't buy their own power. Our commission buys the power uh, for the utilities to distribute. So we, we're an unusual uh, place with respect to normal um, utility issues. So we have to work through that. And on top of that, the entire electric power sector is in an unprecedented transformation. For the last hundred years, we've managed supply to match what demand is by turning up the knob on the power plant or turning it down. But you're not gonna do that with our cheapest, cleanest options, solar and wind. You can't turn the knob on the sun. So we'll have to turn the knob on demand. Well, demand, as I said earlier, is those electric vehicles, those, those electrified homes. So we, we on the energy side need to integrate in an unprecedented close fashion with our transportation counterparts and with our building counterparts uh, going forward on this clean energy quest toward decarbonization. So that, that's my thinking at this point. I hope that's somewhat consistent with Dan's um, and, the, and the work groups and uh, we'll work on this going forward. Look forward to the help from the uh, equity subcommittee folks that will be staffing with us on the energy side. Hope, hope that uh, is along the lines that's useful for you all. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. Um, I was a little flummoxed by suffering as an option, um, but I thought that it, you know, you've highlighted excellently the incredible challenges that are being faced, particularly, you know, in the energy realm. And so it's a great example of, you know, where specifically some of these recommendations intersect with the individual work of the working group. So thank you for that. And lastly, we have Rebecca Bolos, our co-chair for the Community Resilience Planning, Public Health and Emergency Management Working Group, or the Supergroup. 
We are indeed the super group. <laughs> There's a lot going on in our working group. Um, I am just so excited to be working on this. We we had our meeting with the GoPiv team um, and with Carol earlier this week and um, just talking about how this, this process will unfold. And I'm just, I'm so excited to have um, a concrete effort for our working group to move forward on this. For the public health subgroup in particular, I feel like the recommendations align really well with the conversations that we had in our working group and um, and really tangible conversations for us too in moving forward that can be somewhat independent of what's been a lot of legislative activity. And I think that, um, you know, having served on both uh, in, in our working group, but then also on, on the equity subcommittee, as, as Kathleen was talking about earlier, when we did get started a couple of years ago, there was a lot going on. And while we did have to consider equity um, in our recommendations, I also feel like there was just there was a lot uh, there was a lot going on and we, we had a really concrete time pressure. And when we're considering equity, um, we have to be in, intentional about it and they're um, in, in consideration of not just different populations, but why are there health disparities and what are the systems that, that contribute to those and what are uh, appropriate opportunities for us to be able to influence um, health outcomes in a more positive way. And so that's really what the the, the equity subcommittee has been focused on. And, and similarly, too, while we were focused on, on equity, we're not all subject matters in all these different areas. And so while we did hear from representatives from the working groups, um, you know, certainly going back now to the working groups to talk about these recommendations and identify opportunities for synergy, for implementation um, in ways that really bolster the, the recommendations that we have, but also make sure that we're having the intended effects that, that we want to have for everybody in Maine, and I think even for our working group, for our, our super group with our, our three subsections, um, when I just think about, for example, uh, resilience, you know, so much of what we talk about is, is in infrastructure, but it's also about psychological resilience. And that was something that came up in, in, in one of our stakeholder meetings. And as we think about equity in that, how do we strengthen psychological resilience for different segments of the population in response to climate related um, weather events and, and other consequences? So I just I'm I'm really excited about continuing this work forward. I'm excited about opportunities to re engage some of our uh, public health and, and broader working group uh, members. And I just, I do want to thank everybody that has worked on this. Um, it's been quite an undertaking over the past several months. And um, yeah, I'm just really looking forward to it. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Um, I think next, uh, Hannah was going to talk to us more about next steps. Yes, well, I mean, we, first of all, we've done a great job and we've made it through our agenda quickly and that means you all may get uh, an extra few minutes for lunch today. So um, again, thanks for everyone for showing up and paying attention and, and being on time. Um, so I think just to, to remind you, I think Jess said this during her presentation, but the next steps are um, we anticipate the working groups. You've just heard from some of the co-chairs. I see a few others out there. Um, that we will have um, the first meeting to discuss this in May or June. Um, so obviously some of our co-chairs in the middle of legislative sessions and everything else, we're about a month away from that finishing. So um, I think people have the time and bandwidth to dive into that work in May and June. So that meeting will include representatives of the equity subcommittee, include our key staff, Jess, Carol, and others who are gonna support this work with Alum. Um, so that will be the kickoff meeting. Um, then there's time for us to go back and do more work based on the feedback from that meeting. And then September or October, um, the working groups will have another meeting, as well as the Science and Technical Subcommittee, don't mean to leave them out, um, to, to uh, really make the final recommendations based on what we've brought back. Um, and then uh, it will come back to the uh, Equity Subcommittee for some more discussion and then come back to the Maine Climate Council. So a lot of process, but I think I think as folks have highlighted, um, Kathleen's highlighted, this process is important. And again, it's not, you know, we all love to have meetings and we love to have meetings again together um, in person at some point, but these meetings are really about really diving in more deeply into prioritization, into metrics, into um, what this work could mean for the people of Maine. So I, again, just thank you all for 
being willing to stick with us to be part of this process. I'm, I'm grateful in advance for the leadership of our co-chairs who continue now with the, another new but incredibly important project for the Maine Climate Council. Um, and again, for the Climate Council members out there, um, including some of our new members. I see uh, Noelle again on the screen, who was also just confirmed to the Maine Housing Board um, or is about to be. Uh, I think um, this work is, is really important to the council and we look forward to really the final report uh, late this year um, informing the next steps. So that's where we are with process. It's a, it's a lot, I think for the working group members, um, just look uh, to attend a meeting in May or June. That's really the kickoff for you of this work. But in the meantime, again, highly encourage you to read the report that came out of the equity subcommittee. Obviously that will ground you more broadly um, in all the recommendations, but the ones also that are relevant for your group. So um, I think that's all I, I have in terms of process. I will just remind um, everyone, we have our next main climate council um, big picture meeting on May 12th. Um, and that will probably include a lot of exciting updates on where we are, what happened in the legislative session. Um, we always are excited to continue to talk about all the things that are happening, um, but we will likely give a little update on, on where this work is headed as well. So Jess, did I miss anything? Or Melanie? Not at all, Hannah. Just thanks to everyone for your attention um, and to the co-chairs again for working with us on this process. Melanie? Yep, I would echo the same. I'd like to thank everyone for your time and attention today and for the work that you have ahead of you that you'll be doing. I think that uh, we had a lot of information presented today that will hopefully be helpful to you moving forward. And it's wonderful to hear how excited everyone is to be engaged in this work. And so uh, thanks for a great meeting and for a little bit of extra time this morning. Uh, maybe it'll give you time to actually eat lunch before your next meeting. Thanks all. Thanks all right. everyone. Take care. Have a great day. Happy weekends.